Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our chats with Emily as we are calling our readings through the poetry of Emily Dickinson. We are in the Johnson edition. We now turn to poem number 239, Heaven is What I Cannot Reach. Now, this is a, a remarkable poem uh, for so many reasons. Some have read this as another Sue poem. When it was first published in 1896, the, only the first two stanzas of this poem, it was actually titled Forbidden Fruit, and that obviously will take us to our study of Milton and Paradise Lost, and of course the whole idea of biting into an apple. Is this possibly another theodicy poem? That is to say, to try to explain why there must be pain and suffering in the case of Emily, often it's rejection in this world. Or is this in some ways an attack on Christian theology or even on the theodicy of the book of Job? All of that will be subsumed in our conversation here. It's amazing how Emily can pull this off with such a few, few number of lines as we said in earlier lectures. And speaking of earlier lectures, our hope is that you have been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side, Chats with Emily, our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've already worked through our set of introductory comments, for example, our Big Five, what does the text say about epistemology, what you can know, ontology, who you are, psychology, the study of the individual mind, sociology, the study of the collective mind, and then finally, as I mentioned, it, theodicy, the question of why must there be pain and suffering in the world? A little poem like this actually addresses all of these issues. And I find that fascinating. I'm hopeful that as well you've been following and reading the poems up to, and we just finished uh, with um, 238, uh, uh, Kill Your Bomb. And if you have done that, and you've been following us, you know that the tone of this poem is going to sound kind of similar, reminiscent. Of course, we can also make the observation that Emily is always playing around with the readings of her biblical text. And I think there's a whole lot of referencing and allusions happening here that Emily's audience would immediately have understood that we today often need a little bit of help to get to. Now, Paula Bennett, one of the great uh, 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 theorists and, and scholars of Emily's work, has suggested that there may be, if this poem as she reads it is something for, for Sue, that maybe there's a bit of Sappho with the great lesbian poet as part of this as well, and the unreachable apple of Sappho's poem. Um, and obviously, if we're talking about apples, well, obviously we've got to give some time to Milton and Paradise Lost, which we've given full lectures on at LearnStrong.net if you need a review. She begins with the word heaven, 135 poems, heaven or heavenly is used. It's going to be one of her very popular words. Heaven is what I cannot reach. The apple on the tree, provided it do hopeless hang, that heaven is to me. The color on the cruising cloud, the interdicted land behind the hill, the house behind, there paradise is found. Her teasing purples afternoons, the credulous decoy, enamored of the conjurer, that spurned us yesterday. Now, the poem is an interesting poem even to read aloud, and obviously, as I said in earlier lectures, I very much recommend that as you're studying these poems on your own, you guys need to read them out loud. There are so many different ways, for example, to read a poem like this out loud. Notice all of these dashes make it difficult to know specifically how I was to read the poem. Would I pause for each one of these dashes because they're ubiquitous through this poem? Notice we begin with quotation marks, and you've seen this in a number of her poems, where she likes to put these quotation marks around as if she's making some kind of special reference. Is she talking about the heaven, for example, of Christian theology? Heaven is what I cannot reach. Now, that's an interesting idea, because if she's lived a good life, well, she can obviously reach heaven by virtue of dying, yes? And this notion of heaven takes us right back to the very first poem we studied together. Do you remember this, Awake Muses Night, where she says, Earth is a merry damsel, and heaven a night so true. Maybe you'll remember that we played around with that line when we started. When we get to poem 319, we're going to, we're going to um, play around with this idea from this notion of what I can or can't reach. Um, and, it, and it runs something like this. <clears throat> she says it this way. The nearest dream recedes unrealized. The heaven we chase, like the June bee before the schoolboy, invites the race, stoops to an easy clover, dips, evades, teases, deploys, then to the royal clouds lifts his light pennants. You could see so many references, including clouds here. Heedless of the boy, 
staring, bewildered at the mocking sky, homesick for steadfast honey. Ah, the bee flies not that brews that rare variety. When we hit 319, we'll remind ourselves that in 239, we were playing a very similar kind of game. In other words, it seems as if heaven is for her the thing she can never have, the thing she aspires for. Notice she then goes to the apple. And obviously we're thinking of Milton. We're obviously thinking of Genesis 3. The apple on the tree. Uh, again, it, it, are, we, are we dealing with Sappho's unreachable apple? Uh, it's it maybe possible, especially if, we, if you read this poem as some kind of attribution to, uh, to Sue, maybe. The apple on the tree provided it do hopeless hang. In other words, just out of reach, we cannot help but think of Tantalus and the Greek myth here as well. That dash heaven, quotation marks, is dash to me, capitalized M, exclamation point. Notice her use of exclamation points at the end of each of these stanzas. In other words, heaven for me is not something that I'm going to acquire when I die. Heaven for me is something I will never be able to acquire because I never can quite reach the apple that I want. Again, some have read this as a longing uh, for the thing that one can never really have. Some obviously have seen this as her longing for her pal Sue. The color on the cruising cloud, and then all of a sudden that she's moved from Genesis 3, and possibly Milton, but probably more just Genesis 3 and the idea of the apple. Although obviously in Genesis 3, as we said in our lectures on Milton and Paradise Lost, there is no actually mention of an apple. It's, of course, just the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But notice here it's the apple. The color, but from the apple we now move to Exodus 13, 21, and that, and that cloud, that pillar of, uh, of smoke or cloud that led the children of Israel in that text in Exodus 13. The color on the cruising cloud, the interdicted land, the land that you're not allowed to go to. Of course, here we're thinking of Moses and, and the land of Canaan, right? Behind the hill, and this may take some of us to think of John 14, 2 through 6, and my father's house are many mansions, blah, blah, blah. The interdicted land, behind the hill, the house behind, there paradise is found. And of course, the fact that she would use paradise and apple in the same poem takes us immediately to paradise lost, no doubt. In other words, it's the thing that I want that I can never get. That is heaven, but of course the irony is it's actually what? Right, it's actually hell, huh? She goes to the word teasing, and she uses the word purples. And this will make us think, of course, of the idea that Christ himself was dressed in purple in John 19, 2 through 3. We'll remember, hail king of the Jews. Of course, purple is, at the same time, the color of mourning or sadness or lugubriousness, and it's also the color of the king, the majesty, right? Her teasing purples, afternoons, <clears throat> the credulous decoy, and again, this use of the word decoy, enamored of the conjurer. Now, the use of the word enamored is fascinating for Emily. Seven times in seven poems she'll use it. 294, she'll use it. 505, she'll use it. Uh, 1496, she'll use it, and 1629, she'll use it. But I'm interested in her use of the word in 1403. And when we study this poem in 1403, we'll come back to this poem, in fact. My maker, let me be, enamored most of thee, but nearer this I more should miss. This The ironic use of the word enamored of the conjurer. She'll only use this word conjurer one time in all of her poetry, and it's here. And is she speaking now about Christ and the resurrection from the dead as conjurer, or the miracle worker Christ as conjurer? Obviously, the idea of the magician and all of that. That spurned us, and there, of course, is the shoe drops, right? That's, oh, okay. So Emily has somehow or another been spurned. Spurned by who? This is why many will see this as, a, as another shoe poem. And then the immediacy of the poem with the last word, yesterday. In other words, what are we really playing with here at 2A? Well, I think that she will make the argument, as the great scholar Wolf has pointed out, that happiness seems to exist in a, quote, state of ellipse, uh, and, and, uh, and maybe even there's a cycle of torture that he talks about. I'll just quote Wolf here, uh, because I think he's on to something. He says, this is not, this poem, is not a catalog of unrelieved pain, it's something worse, the chronicle of a cycle of torture that will last until the end of time. God restrains his cruelty just long enough to give us optimism and ensnare our trust. Once we relax our vigilance, he strikes us and wounds again. Yet, 
as soon as we recoil and turn away, God woos us with the blandishments of eternal life and happiness like a cat with a mouse. He prefers torture to instant execution. Beneath all other patterns of divine providence is this elemental structure, this pattern of taunting uncertainty that is laid out before us in the Bible and reaffirmed by the experience of every human life. And the signs of it can be found throughout the created world. Here then is the ultimate target of all of Dickinson's investigations of narrative form and structuring orders to take it together. The poems that expose God's invariable experiment constitute a biting, scathing, bitterly satirical refutation of the biblical claim that humans can always discern a pattern of benevolent providential history in the workings of the world. It's an interesting take on this poem. And I just, I read that uh, quote at length to give you a sense of how a little poem like this can lead scholars to say, Emily is so ahead of her time in, in, in her critique, maybe we would say, her, of, of, of the theodicy of the book of Job, we might say. Uh, at 2B, well, all the biblical allusions, I think, are here pretty handily, and, and, and we want to pay attention to them. At 3A, Milton's Paradise Lost, as we said, comes to mind. Um, when we study poem 300, and, uh, and, and I'll, just, I'll just read it for you just so you've got a sense of it. When we get ready, we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to this poem again when we study poem 300. It goes like this. Morning means milking to the farmer, dawn to the tenefer, dice to the maid. Morning means just risk to the lover, just revelation to the beloved. Epicures date a breakfast by it, brides an apocalypse, whirls a flood, faint going lives, their lapse from sighing, faith, the experiment of our Lord. Um, and again, when we hit that poem, we'll come back to this poem to remind ourselves. At poem 640, <clears throat> when we study this one, it will, uh, it will run like this. I cannot live with you. It would be life, and life is over there behind the shelf. The sexton keeps the key to putting up our life. His porcelain like a cup, discarded of the housewife, quaint or broke. A newer sevs, please. One old's, one old one's crack. I could not die with you. But one must wait to shut the other's gaze down. You could not. And I, could I stand by and see you freeze without my right of frost, death's privilege. Nor could I rise with you because your face would put out Jesus's, that new grace, glow plain and foreign on thy homesick eye, except that you, then he, shown closer by, they judge us how for you served heaven, you know, or sought to, I could not, because you saturated sight, and I had no more eyes for sordid excellence's paradise. And were you lost, I would be, though my name rang loudest on the heavenly fame. And were you saved, and I condemned to be, where you were not, that self were hell to me. Notice from heaven to hell in this poem. So we must meet apart, you there, I here, with just the door ajar, that oceans are, and prayer, and that white sustenance, despair. It may be that this is a poem of despair. Of course, we can think about the book of Job, another theodicy, and of course, Dante's divine Commedia as well. Finally, a 3B to own a poem like this. When was a time when you wanted something and you just couldn't reach it? That is to say, you knew what your heaven was, and not attaining it was your hell. I hope these poems are challenging you. Thank you.